Hi YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Um, apologize I didn't get um, a little bit of the chapter in yesterday. I was six minutes into it and I got a call from my daughter who was upset because one of her friends just got badly beaten up by her boyfriend. So I kept I went back to it and I just kept making comments about domestic violence and people's need to be honest with themselves and get therapy. But that kept me from posting. I could just not get through with it. I was kind of upset a lot. So I thought I'd try today. It's 2.30 in the afternoon. I have a little bit of a break in work. So I'm going to try to read a little bit and um, we'll see where it goes. And I'm just going to post up however far I get on this. I'm going to try to read five pages and see how that works. So I'm on page 39 in uh, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Goffman, Tamplin and Goffman. And I don't know why. It's kind of curious why one guy has his name first, not Goffman and Tamplin, but that's the way it is. So we're starting on the subchapter in Chapter 3. Chapter 3 is Beware the Gallant Night of Technological Progress. The subchapter... We only have a page and a half to read left, so I'm going to go back and reread it because I think I didn't read very well the other night. Safety record claims are false. For now, we have been hearing, for years now, we have been hearing of the inordinately good record of the atomic energy industry with respect to safety and freedom from fatal accidents. Parentheses. Just because the AEC commissioners are making such assert assertions, we should not automatically assume that the assertions are false. End parentheses. However, even minor probing is sufficient to reveal that the assertion of a good safety record is not only false, it is absurd. It turns out that the record is good because it is defined so. Defining a record as good is achieved by the simple expedient of vigorously denying culpability for deaths that are obviously the direct result of the exposure to radiation of the industrial worker. Let us consider the case of the atomic energy industry worker who received over a period of 10 years the amount of radiation labeled as tolerance. This he is legally allowed to receive. Our estimates in good general accord with those of respected of the respected International Commission on Radiological Protection would indicate that after a latency period of five to ten years or so, one out of every two cancers occurring in such re workers are the direct result of occupational exposure. So if we observe a hundred cases of cancer or leukemia in such workers, the present evidence indicates approximately 50 of them are occupational. By the remarkable expedient of defining a radiation dose as doubles, which doubles the cancer rate as tolerance, the atomic energy industry absolves itself of its responsibility for these cancers. Let me read that sentence again because that's vital. By the remarkable expedient of defining a radiation dose, which doubles the cancer rate as tolerance, the atomic energy industry absolves itself of responsibility for these cancers. Ding, ding, ding. Thus, by simple definition, the atomic energy industry has an excellent safety record, even though it produces thousands of fatal cases of cancer and leukemia. Technology sings itself praises of the wondrous benefits it is conferring, or is about to confer, upon the unwitting population. When pressed, a technological superagency, such as the AEC, adds to its repertoire of lullabies about benefits with a new tune entitled, The Benefits Outweigh the Risks. As sung by the AEC commissioners, the ditty is meaningless, and of course, we have no intention that it shall be otherwise. But within these words is the germ of an idea that can be the basis of a rational approach to technology and its associated poisonous byproducts. Society may indeed require the benefits, the benefits a new or existing technology has to offer. Further, society may find itself in a position where it is willing to accept certain grave risks in exchange for receipt of the benefits. It can be said without any fear of contradiction that society has never been given the opportunity to do so for three major reasons. Number one, the benefits have always been vaguely described at best. Number two, the risks have been denied, minimized, or lied about. 
And number three, no weighing of benefits against risks, excuse me, no weighing of benefits against risk by society has ever been approached. Since self-style expert groups have made such dubious calculations of this sort for society. Excuse me, I'll read that again. No weighing of benefits against risk by society has, has even been approached since self-styled expert groups have made any such dubious calculations of this sort for society. The flagrant disregard for the primacy of human health in such matters is beautifully illustrated in the 1967 hearings before the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy on the subject of the outrageously high lung cancer death rate being caused in uranium miners by exposure to radioactivity in the mines. We quote directly from the Federal Radiation Council report number eight. This is their report. Title. Factors related to the evaluation of benefit and control capabilities. Available information on benefits to be derived from the mining of uranium, difficulties encountered in reducing radon daughter concentrations from previous levels of current levels, and the additional difficulties that can be anticipated if further reduction in radon daughter concentrations are required has been, re has been reviewed. The finding of immediate interests are as follows. Number one. Uranium is currently the basic fuel needed for the development of nuclear energy, and all projections point to an increasing important role for nuclear energy in meeting national electric power requirements. That's bullshit. Number two, uranium mining is an important economic asset to the states in which the ore is mined. In addition to the value of the ore, mining provides important opportunities for employment. It is estimated that the workforce will vary between 2,000 and 5,000 men in the next decade. Those poor bastards. Stripped of euphemisms, the Federal Radiation Council staff appears to be saying it would be tragic to have nuclear fuel, in quotes, uranium, cost a little more than just to keep uranium miners from an epidemic rate of lung cancer. After all, the country needs electric power. Further, it may help the economy of the mining states. And if we make the mines safe, business might decline. The final result of this magnanimous weighing of benefits versus risks occurred when the Redoubtable Atomic Energy Commission recently awarded a 200,000 contract to the Arthur, a., the Arthur D. Little firm to study the economic impact on the uranium mining industry if they were forced to clean up the mines to a point where the lung cancer epidemic among miners was mitigated somewhat. This is not a reasonable manner in which to manage the affairs of a great nation. And all of this teaches us, and we should teach the Congress, a most important lesson in the effort to preserve a livable environment for human beings with respect to radioactivity and other pollutants. Expecting scientists and other experts whose research funds and livelihood come from the promoter of technology to provide the truth concerning hazards, where the truth thwarts the technology, is like expecting our Christmas Eve dreams of sugar plum fairies to become a reality. Sugar plum fairies may be real, but we better not count on it. So I'm going to stop there. We're at chapter four now. Maybe this evening uh, after I'm all said and done with my day's duties that I can come and read a little bit more. So, tell you guys, I hope everybody's uh, keeping your spirits up. And uh, again, on the domestic violence issue, the only way we're going to stop domestic violence is for people to be honest and to get help. You're not, you know, it's it's a very serious issue. And there's a really great documentary called Tough Guys, G-U-I-S-E, and I seriously recommend it to all men. Our culture of men have just, their minds have been twisted by this whole war machine thing that's going on that's training them basically to be violent human beings. And that's a completely unnecessary paradigm. So I'm going to keep going. Ciao, you guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye.